So tell us a bit more about No More Names and why you started it. In the- yeah, yeah, yeah. So No More Names came about partially because... Actually, I like to play because there's other stuff to me. Oh. Uh, Actually, we'll, we'll talk about that after you go on. So I just, police retired is something I always cared about. Like I said, Michael Brown was, you know, killed before I came into college. Trayvon Martin was killed when I moved to the U.S. Eric Garner was killed right around when I came to college. And, like, when I first got to college, there was these protests. And, you know, I participated in some of these protests. And, you know, throughout college, it's something that, you know, I would speak about, I would tweet about. I always thought it was unacceptable. And But, you know, I feel like I did... Like, I used to talk about it, I would write about it, I, like, wrote some poems, etc. But then, you know, um, my senior year came, basketball season finished, and, like, right around that same time, Stephon Clark was killed, and, like, the initial reports were talking about how he got shot 20 times. And he was, like, Damn. unarmed. And I was, like, he shot him 20 times. And I was just, like, wow, like, let's do something. And me and my room were literally just chilling, chilling in the dining hall. I'm, like, let's do something. And, like, so I'm, like, let's... Why don't we like my the previous year we had run a fundraiser for a woman with breast cancer yeah. called Thank You Black Woman. And I was just like, okay, let's run a fundraiser, like a benefit concert. And my friend's like, you know, that's a lot of work, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, nah, I can't be that much work. <laughs> and then <laughs> it ended up being a lot of work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had no event experience. But, you know, thankfully, I had like immense support from the administration at Harvard. Um, I had immense support from a great team of people. Also, like, interesting enough, like, right at that time, when we decided to do this, a Harvard student was beat by the police, which just, like, raised the stakes to a whole other level. So we ended up being fortunate enough to bring in Vic Mensa. He performed, uh, he spoke, and we had a bunch of student performers. We raised, like, $7,000 for the event, Yeah, a little bit over $7,000, and that's kind of the start of No More Names. Just the idea that, like, Stefan Clark was, like, just another name in, like, this list. Like, I could, like... A lot of, like, most black people can recite, like, a list of names, like Tamir Rice, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Walter Scott, um, Oscar Grant, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, like, a long list of people. And it's just, like, I I want my kids to grow up in a world where there's no more names. And that's kind of, like, the impetus for the org. And then this past year, you know, after we ran the event, I like fell asleep on my friend's floor. I was so tired. But then the next day, I was like, "Yo, we could do this other places too." Like, yeah. so that was the idea. And then we ran events at Harvard this year, Princeton. Uh, we ran an event at uh, Brown with Meg Thee Stallion, Dartmouth with Roy Woods, um, Columbia with Aton Thomas and Emerald Garner, Yale with uh, Dave East and Aton Thomas. So we it was just we ran these all these events. It was just a matter of, you know, connecting students with the issue, with people who are dealing with the issue, with artists and influence. And it's kind of what we did, man. We had a National Day of Remembrance in February where people would share on their stories the names of victims. Um, we, were, we, you know, and then we, just yesterday, we, you know, we helped organize uh, a memorial event in Harlem with... Um, I can't breathe! I can't yeah, our memorial event in Harlem with, you know... I've had the privilege of getting closer with Emerald Garner, yeah. who's like one of the most impressive people I've ever met. She's just a special person. And, um, you know, we've just been trying to help her out in, you know, her quest for justice. So that's kind of what we've been doing. We hope to, you know, continue to spread our work to, you know, more schools and connect more students with organizations doing good work. Because I think what we can do is function as kind of like a bridge between young people and the work that's being done. That's right. And, uh, and, you know, helping out organizations that are short-staffed with, like, student volunteers that, like, want to help but don't know where to start. Um, so, yeah, I think it's been, you know, some of the most important work I've done in my life. And obviously it's challenging. It sounds it's hard. Like, you know, we were planning a lot of these events when, um, like, a lot of the stuff we were planning was supposed to happen in February. We started planning, you know, during the summer. I found my dad had cancer end of October. He passed start of January, which is like a month before the event. So I'm like, damn, like, do I really want to do this still? Like, this is still a lot of work. I just remember, like, Emma Garner's dad passed, and she had to watch that video over and over again. And, like, she got up every day. Like, they got up every day, and they went to work and fight for justice. And I'm like, if she can do that, and 
you know, have to deal with the trauma of continuously seeing, like, her dad said, I can't breathe 11, 11 times to the officer. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. 11 times. And he ended up dying from not being able to breathe. Yeah. You know, to see that and be like, okay, so why didn't he stop? And you're always going to wonder that. Mm-hmm. And to keep going and to keep fighting even five years later. Like, if she can do that, like, I sure as hell can, like, organize some event on some campus. So, yeah, that was a challenge, but it's, like, you know, like, through it all, just a matter of... And then, again, like, also, like, I feel like a lot of times it can be, like, oh, Chris does no more. No, it's, like, we have the most incredible team of people. We have, like, Michelle Bannerman. Like, I can go on for Bormater, um, Isaac at Yale, Demi at Dartmouth. Khalif and Tim at Brown, Jade at Columbia, Casey, Michael at Harvard. Um, you know, I'm probably going to forget some names, but just Jael at Cornell. Um, just like an incredible group of people at all these campuses who have like dedicated real time to like making this happen. Yeah. And then like those are the people who make no more names, no more names. Literally, I like just like stand up and smile and like, you know, like, but those people's hearts and their commission. Their, their commitment and their willingness to not, you know, give up in the fight for justice, that's, like, super inspiring. And it's just, like, super powerful. Like, Jalen, all these guys. And it's, like, it's become a family of some sort for me. It's, like, it um, people. should put it up on the screen. Don't Don't names. Yeah, we did already. But I'll um, put it up again. But um, one question I had, though, was... Oh, this is Vic Mensa, right? Yeah. Um, one question I had, though, is, like, so this is, like, obviously really cool stuff you're doing, but I know, like, right now, mm. America, super polarized political climate right now. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get any, especially on a topic like police brutality, which is very, very controversial, mm. do you ever get any pushback from people or any sort of, like, criticism? Or Yeah. yeah really? For sure. But, you know, I think fundamentally, you know, I just know what's right in my heart, mm-hmm. and I, I try and live by what I think is right. You know, at the end of the day, uh, if a man says I can't breathe eleven times, like you, like you release a chokehold. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And you know, police officers aren't. You know, I don't think all police officers are bad. I don't hate the police. I just understand that police officers aren't executioners. Mm-hmm. Like you know, That's okay, a guy was selling cigarettes, and that doesn't mean he gets a death sentence. Mm. Like, the fact that people are getting the death sentence for what? Like, that's kind of fundamentally, like, we live in a system where it's, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. Everybody has the right to due process. And it seems a lot, a lot often that black people aren't the people getting the access. So it's a controversial issue, but I just kind of know where I stand. It's just, like, I think it's easier to know where you stand on the issue when it could be you. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm a big black guy, like, yeah. you know, your target. I, you have the conversation with your parents about, like, how you have to interact yep, with the police. Yep, yep, yep. Because, like, if I reach to my pocket, I, think it's, I it's might not live to ever see another day. So I have to communicate. I'm reaching for my ID officer. I'm not, I'm not armed. Yeah. And stuff like that. And it's like, there's 10-year-old kids who learn this. Yeah. And a system in which people have fear of the people who are supposed to protect and serve them is an inherently flawed system. And I think, you know, there's more work to be done in terms of how do we address that? How do we rethink what policing is? How do we rethink what justice is? How do we rethink, you know, even detention, like putting people in jail? Like, how do we rethink what that is? Because is that really the best way to stop crime? Is that really the best way to rehabilitate people? Should we re- should we be sending, you know, thousands of young black men to jail for nonviolent drug offenses for drugs that are now legal in a lot of the US? Yeah. I think the answer is obvious to a lot of those questions. Yeah. Let's go. Check. She ain't gotta tell me what to do with it. I already know. Been knew I had a juice with it. Y'all ain't ready though. Outside got the vision going. I'm-